Well, the two verses we're going to cover this evening have special meaning for me, really for two reasons. First of all, uh, the 33 years that I have been a Christian, I have been privileged to disciple many women, and it truly has been one of the greatest joys of my life is to make disciples and to watch women grow and then pass on the baton to other women. And the second reason that these two verses have special meaning for me is because several years ago on my husband's 50th birthday, I uh, took these two verses and I had them calligraphied and on the top I put his mentor, Dr. Stewart, who by the way had the whole Bible memorized, and uh, then I put these two verses and then I put my husband's picture on the bottom and I had it put in a very nice frame and uh, it's hanging in his office even now and it's a reminder of the man who poured into my husband as well as his responsibility to make disciples and pour into other men which he does. Now you might say well Susan what verses are these? Well let's read them together 2 Timothy 2 1 and 2. Notice what Paul writes. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me, from many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, our outline for this evening is going to be threefold. The, the title of this lesson is A High Call to Discipleship. We're going to see the character of those who disciple, the curriculum that we use when we disciple, and then lastly, the character of those who are discipled. So the character of those who disciple, the curriculum we use to disciple, and then the character of those who are discipled. Now we ended chapter one last week contrasting uh, those two men who defected from the faith compared to Onesiphorus who was a genuine disciple of the faith. And we saw that those uh, who defect from the faith, they turn away. And in contrast, we saw Onesiphorus. And we saw five characteristics of him, and I put them in an acrostic uh, mercy. We saw that genuine disciples, they minister to others, they earnestly sacrifice for others, they refresh others, uh, they're courageous, and they yield their life. And so we ended by saying that Onesiphorus would be a wonderful example to the Apostle Paul of someone to emulate, certainly not Phygelius and Hermogenes who, dis who defected from the faith. And so Paul reminds Timothy of the high call of discipleship by bringing out first the character of those who disciple, those who pour their life into others, what kind of character are they supposed to have? Well, look at verse 1. He says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And anytime there's a therefore, we've always mentioned that we need to go back. So what Paul is saying, you therefore, Timothy, because of the bad example of the two men who defected from the faith, plus all those in Asia who turned away from me, and you therefore, because of the good example of Onesiphorus, then you, Timothy, you therefore, because of these two examples, you be strong. You be strong in the faith. Don't be a defector of the faith. Timothy, resist the temptation to turn away from the truth. Now, what does Paul mean when he tells him to be strong? Well, it means to be empowered, to be enabled. In fact, one man says the verb be strong is an imperative, making it a command, yet it is a command tempered by Paul's deep love for Timothy, his son. He goes on to say, there was tenderness in Paul's heart because there is tenderness in God's heart. Even the Lord's strongest commands are given in love. He admonishes his children firmly but lovingly, and that is the way Paul admonished his spiritual son, Timothy, end of quote. In fact, this strength, he says, when you be strong, Timothy, this strength is ongoing power. It's just not a power that Timothy will have at one time, nor is it for you and I, ladies. The power that we had from, have from the Lord is limitless. In fact, we looked several weeks ago at the mighty power of God. In fact, Psalm 147, 5 reminds us, great is the Lord. He's mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. And so Paul tells Timothy, you be strong in the faith. Faith. You be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Ladies, without him, we can do nothing. In fact, I just got off the phone a little while ago with a young girl I've been trying to help for years, and 
not having any success in her in the struggle she's having and I kept reminding her you're trying to do this on your own you can't do this without the Lord it has to be with the power and the strength of him uh, we can't do anything without him in fact uh, it's interesting when uh, we have the first mention of disciple making in Matthew 28. Remember the before Jesus ascended into heaven, one of his last words was, "Go ye into all the world and and preach the gospel to every nation, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you." And then he says something very interesting, and we don't really think about this. Lo, I am with you always. And you know what? That's a promise for. It's a promise that God will be with you during the discipling process as you go and make disciples. And so that's the same thing that Paul is telling Timothy. You be strong in the Lord as you commit to faithful men the things that I have taught you. In fact, the Lord told Joshua the same thing when he was uh, succeeding Moses. Remember after Moses died and Joshua became the successor? Uh, two times the Lord says in Joshua 1, 6 to 8, be strong and of good courage. And in verse 7, he says, be strong, be courageous. Don't be a wimp. Be strong in the Lord. And so just as Moses passed the baton to Joshua, Paul is now passing the baton to Timothy. And so he says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What is grace? Well, grace is divine influence upon the heart. As uh, Christ told Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And now Paul is telling Timothy the same thing. Timothy, God's grace is sufficient for you in your weakness. And remember, Timothy had a lot of fears. He was a timid guy. And we've already studied this this year already. But Paul says, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In all the fears that you have as you minister to others, as you disciple other men, Timothy, you be strong in the grace, not in you, in this grace that is in Christ Jesus. It is enough for you, Timothy. So what's the character of those who disciple according to this text? They must be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. They must be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, I am sure these words must have encouraged Timothy to continue on after Paul's death. However, maybe he's thinking, okay, Paul, I'll be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, but what do I teach to these men? I mean, what am I supposed to teach them? Well, Paul now writes about the curriculum that he is to use in discipleship in verse 2. Notice what he says. And the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul says, Timothy, this is what you teach. This is the curriculum. The things that you have heard from me, that is what you pass on. In fact, he's already made mention of this in 2 Timothy 1.13 that we've already looked at. Remember what he told Timothy? Hold fast the pattern of sound words, which you've heard from me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And then later on, as we get to chapter 3, verse 14, he's going to say, Timothy, continue in the things that you have learned and been assured of knowing from who you have learned them. Remember, Timothy, hold fast to sound doctrine. Now, what are the things that Timothy heard from Paul? Well, he mentions some of those in 2 Timothy 3, 10 and 11, if you want to look there. He says, you've carefully followed my doctrine. So he learned doctrine from Timothy, my manner of life. That means he learned how to live out what Paul preached, my purpose for living, my faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance. Timothy, you've watched my persecutions, my afflictions, all of these things. And so Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, the things that you've learned from me, not just doctrine, but how I've suffered, how I love people, how I'm long-suffering, those things you pass on to other men. And not only did Timothy hear all these things from Paul, but if you did your lesson, which I hope you did, and you skimmed Acts, you might go, what is skimming? Well, it's kind of where you read fast. And, uh, but, you know, that's what I did. I just skimmed and kind of got the highlights. But hopefully, if you did that, 
it wasn't just Timothy that was there listening to these things that Paul was doing in Acts, I think it was 16 to 20, but many other witnesses were there also. And so they were observing uh, the Apostle Paul as he was teaching and living his life before them. So what is the curriculum we use in discipleship? If you're taking notes, it's biblical truth biblical truth. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 28, go make disciples, teach them what? Come on girls, you know that verse. Whatever I have commanded you, right? So that would mean what? This entire body of truth, right? And so the disciples, the curriculum we use in discipleship is biblical truth. And I have to emphasize that today because there's not much biblical truth going on uh, in our churches. And certainly, uh, if it's not going on in the churches, it's not going on in discipleship. So what does Timothy do with what Paul has taught him? Notice what Paul says. He says, commit these things to faithful men, to faithful men. The word commit here means to deposit as you would a trust for protection or like if you were going to make a deposit in the bank in a savings account, uh, hopefully you, you know, take your money to the bank and you put it in a savings account in hopes that what? That it'll multiply, right? And you will have more money when, you know, it earns interest. So it is with truth, ladies. We take spiritual truth that has been passed on to us and we invest it into other women so that they can what? Multiply. Pass it on to others. You know, when you come on Tuesday night and you hear truth or you come to your church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, or whenever you worship, you're supposed to take that spiritual truth and you don't bury it, right? You, you pass it on to others. And so I hope that is what you are doing so that others can multiply. Well, know what kind of men Timothy is to make a deposit in. Notice what he says, faithful men, faithful men. Ladies, this is the character of those that we disciple. This is the kind of woman you want to disciple, faithful. This would mean genuine believer. They're faithful to what they believe in, and they're also trustworthy. Uh, this would be the opposite of Phygelius and Hermogenes who defected from the faith. Now, I can tell you in the 33 years that I have been discipling women, uh, there are many I've discipled that are not faithful. Uh, they're not faithful to the faith they say they believe in. They're not faithful uh, to the means of grace. And it's very difficult. And the older I get, I think the wiser I get, hopefully, uh, because in my humble opinion, it's a waste of my time and their time. And those relationships usually don't last very long if they're not faithful. And so Paul tells Timothy, pass on what I've taught you, but Timothy, pass on to faithful men. Faithful men, men who are believers and men who are faithful to the things of Christ. And so that would include a lot of things like uh, prayer and Bible reading and uh, church attendance and all the means of grace. You want faithful people to pour your life into. Ladies, what a joy to think that Paul deposited biblical truth into Timothy and now he gets the privilege of doing the same with other faithful men. And the joy is that these men will teach others also, right? And uh, that is the beauty of disciple making. In fact, who knows how many millions of God's children have been discipled through the ages, and it began with the Apostle Paul. Isn't that kind of exciting uh, to think of that? Ladies, we too have been entrusted with precious rich truths from God's word, and our responsibility is not just to keep them to ourselves, but take what we've learned and pass it down to others. And so I would ask, what truths are you passing down to others? Are you passing down sound doctrine, biblical truth? You know, I tell my two children often, because I have seven grandchildren total, and uh, I tell them often I fear for my grandkids. I really do, and you know why? Because the generation coming up, they no longer study theology. I mean, they don't even know what theology. They've traded theology for technology. In fact, I was reading some horrifying statistics today in the news about uh, technology and how it's just swallowing, swallowing up our children. And so we no longer study theology, but instead we're wasting our days in trivial games and trite pursuits on social media instead of time in the Word. Now, 
you might want to know why I needed extra time because you're saying, okay, you finished those two verses. What are you going to do now? Well, I'm not done yet. I want to take the rest of this lesson and I want to consider another passage which is key to disciple making for women. And so I want you to turn in your Bibles to Titus 2. Titus 2, because I've been hearing a lot of rumbling uh, since we started 2 Timothy in September, and it's good rumblings. I've heard that many of you have started discipleship relationships, which I am very excited about. And so I want to use this same text, this same outline that I just gave you as we think through the high call to discipleship in Titus 2. We're going to look at the character of those who should disciple, the curriculum we use to disciple, and then the character of those that we want to pour our lives into, okay? So if you would turn to Titus 2, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. Well, let's start with verse 1, uh, what Paul, and by the way, this is another spiritual uh, son of Paul, was Titus. Uh, he and uh, Titus had been ministering on the Isle of Crete, and for some reason Paul had to leave, and so he left Titus there by himself. And Titus had to begin churches, and that's why he starts with qualification of elders and what he should look for, and then he goes on to describe in verse 2 what men and women should be doing. And notice what he says in verse 1 of chapter 2. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for notice, sound doctrine. There we have it again. The older men are to be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, love, patience. The older women likewise, they have re be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine. Teachers good things that they may admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. And as I said, we're going to take that same outline, the character of those who disciple, the curriculum we use to disciple, and then the character of those who are discipled. So let's look at the character of those women who are to be discipling other women. But first of all, first of all I want you to notice that this is a command, just like Paul gave a command to Timothy, you therefore go and make disciples. Paul says the same thing here, you men Disciple young men. You older men, disciple young men. You older women are to disciple young women. In fact, the word for teach here in the Greek means to school or to train. Old women are to school or to train young women. Now, you might ask the question, well, what does older mean? Well, it could mean two things. It could mean, number one, she might be older in age or she could be older spiritually than the woman that she disciples. And everyone in, he, everyone in here is older than someone. I see no newborn babies here. So uh, everyone in here is older than someone else, right? But uh, speaking of old women, I do think it's very unfortunate that uh, in our culture that we kind of put old people on shelves and we say, you know, they don't really have anything to offer. And for the Church of Jesus Christ, that should not be because ladies with age comes wisdom, secrets of living, and uh, so we should be tapping in. I know before my father died at the age of 96, every time I'd go see him, I'd ask him more questions. I wanted to learn as much as I could from an older person. And so uh, we would be wise to utilize the older people that are in our church uh, because they have so much to pour into us. Now, this does not mean that young women cannot disciple. We have several in our church that disciple teenagers, and uh, I am very thankful for that. I know when my children were growing up, they were both discipled uh, by someone else other than, you know, the things that Doug and I would pour into them. And I think I've shared with you before that uh, I remember one time my daughter came home and she said, Mom, guess what? Guess what Terry told me today? And I said, what, honey? And she told me, and I said, I've been telling you that your whole life, you know. But uh, she listened to Terry, and I'm very thankful that she did. And so many times uh, it is very good to have, uh, you know, someone else discipling, a godly person discipling your teenager, and I would wholly uh, endorse that. But notice that Paul gives four elements that he assumes will be characteristics of these old women who are involved in teaching or discipling young women. First of all, he says they must be reverent in their behavior. The Greek word is a priestess. Uh, she must be holy woman. She must be separated. Uh, she must have a godly separated life. Why? Well, let me ask you a question. Would you want an ungodly woman discipling you? 
I don't think so, right? Because you'll get to be just like her. Secondly, she should not be a slander. This means she should not be involved in gossip or slander. Uh, John Calvin said, talkativeness is a disease of women. It gets worse with age. So see what you have to look forward to when you get old like me. But again, if you are being discipled by a woman who has a problem with gossip or slander, you're going to that you're gonna mimic her. You're going to learn that sin. Thirdly, they're not to be given to much wine. You might say, why is this here? Well, the Isle of Crete was a port city, and so there was a lot. In fact, even chapter 1, verse 12 says, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, this testimony is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply. So uh, the Cretans were known to be a race that was given over to lust and passion, and so drunkenness was a problem on the Isle of Crete. And so Paul says the women that are going to pour into other women should not be enslaved to wine. They should not be drunks. And could I add a principle here? I think it would be very wise for any discipling relationship of a woman pouring into another woman that she should not probably do that if she is enslaved to any sin. It's not going to mean that she's sinless because nobody in here is sinless. Every one of you have committed a sin today, and don't tell me you haven't because if you do, then you're lying and that's a sin. But every one of us in here has sinned today. Nobody in here is sinless. But it would be wise for, uh, for a woman who is not, for a woman who is uh, involved in ensla some type of enslaved sin to not uh, be discipling another woman unless she's actively trying to put that sin to death. The reason is the disciple will mimic that. And uh, sinful habits that older women have can be mimicked by the person being discipled. And so um, that just behooves us to repent, right? Fourthly, Paul says she's to be a teacher of good things, a teacher of good things. And then he gives a list of those good things that we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, again, we would want someone discipling us who's going to teach us good things, right? Not bad things. So what is the character of those who disciple, if you're taking notes? Older women who are godly in behavior, not enslaved to wine or any other sin, not involved in slander, and those who teach good things. Now, next, what is the character of the women we disciple? Well, here, Paul tells Titus specifically in verse 4 that older women are to teach or disciple young women. And again, this might be someone younger in age than you or younger spiritually than you are. Uh, most of the women I meet, meet with are younger than me. However, there's a few uh, that are older in age, uh, but I am older in the Lord than they are. So, uh, But I will tell you from many years of doing this, for me, uh, it's usually I'm the one that's blessed. I know a lot of times Doug will say, well, how did it go with so-and-so, or how did it go with such-and-such? And I'll say, you know, I'm the one that came home blessed and challenged. And uh, and it's been a joy. As Proverbs says, iron sharpens iron. And so uh, it's not just always me giving the instruction. And so, um, you know, that is a blessing in itself. And I would also bring out when we're thinking about who we disciple, remember what Paul said that he wanted Timothy to pass on to faithful men. And so I would put that together when I'm thinking about discipling a young woman. And that is a woman, a young woman who will be faithful faithful to meet with me, faithful to complete any assignments, uh, faithful to the things of Christ. And so certainly that would be very important or your discipling relationship will be very rocky. Now, let's consider next the curriculum we use in discipleship. What do we use in discipleship? A lot of times, in fact, this weekend, Debbie and I were in Upper State, New York, and, and I was asked, uh, about disciple making and you know what kind of curriculum do we use and how many people in our church are being discipled and all that stuff and you know even though there is some good material out there there's some very dangerous material out there so outside of the scriptures if you're going to use any books i would encourage you to talk to the elders in your church and make sure they're sound books before uh, you use them in disciple making there is some good stuff but there's bad stuff but the great thing about the curriculum it's right here you know, you don't have to go to, you know, Lifeway or Mardell's. It is right here. So the first thing, and it's a sevenfold curriculum, the first thing in Paul's curriculum of what we teach is to teach women to be sober-minded, sober-minded. Now, the Greek word is sophron, and it means to be self-controlled 
to have a control to limit her freedoms. Elizabeth Elliot says it means to wise her up to her wifely duties. Uh, she should have restraints on her passions. Uh, young women need to be taught to be sensible, to use good judgment, to keep their passions under control. And I remember this. I got married when I was 19, and we went on a honeymoon. We came back, and one of the first meals I fixed was tacos because I thought everyone loved Mexican, and I found out later he did, and I thought I'd married the Antichrist. But anyway, I made tacos. I think it was our first meal, and we're sitting in our little table, you know, in our cute little apartment. I said, do you like the tacos? And he goes, no, I hate them. And I didn't talk to him for three days. And so, you know, I need an older woman to come alongside me and say, that is sinful, Susan, and uh, you need to, you know, repent. So, uh, but, but young women need to be taught to have their emotions under control. Um, it would not just be her emotions, her physical passions maybe, her sexual appetite, her physical appetite, her speech. Uh, young women need to be taught how to have their speech controlled. Uh, this is one that we all need. We need to train women to speak words that are edifying and encouraging and not tear other people down with their words. Uh, Self-control would also include financial area. I have counseled many women who uh, spend outside of the means that God has provided for them, and so we might need to help her in budgeting and uh, coupon shopping or whatever it takes to teach her to be controlled in her spending habits. Also, I think this is a huge one, and this is uh, probably the main thing that I do when I disciple a, a woman, when I'm thinking about self-control, since that's the first thing I'm to teach her, is to keep her thought life under control. And I will tell you, um, not just young women, but all women uh, seem to go out of their minds with unrealistic and hysterical thoughts. And I remember when I was first married and Doug would be late coming home from the church office and we didn't have cell phones back then. And so, you know, I had him dead and buried and I'd already planned his funeral and was crying by the time he walked in the front door. And then I'd usually, you know, because I wasn't a believer, I'd yell at him, where have you been? And that was ridiculous. That is ridiculous. My mind was out of control. And so we need to teach young women to uh, keep their minds under control to replace useless thoughts with God-honoring thoughts. So instead of thinking, you know, my husband's late, he must be dead, he must be in a traffic accident, you know, I might say, oh, my husband's late. That's true, but maybe he's in a traffic jam or... Maybe he stopped to get me some flowers at the store or some candy. I don't know. But you know what? Even if he's dead and in a traffic accident, or God will give me the grace, right, to go through that. And so we need to teach women uh, how to renew their minds and thoughts with the Word of God. And that's why I am such a big advocate of Scripture memorization. In fact, this hit home to me just last week. I was Skyping with a gal in American Samoa, and she's on her second book of the Bible. She's memorizing, and we've gone through a couple of my studies, and... And I said, Fiva, I said, you are growing so much. I met her when Cindy and I went to Fiji a couple of years ago. And I said, you're growing so much spiritually. And uh, she said, I know. And I said, I'm just, I said, do you see the growth? And does Rodney see the growth? And she said, yes. And, and I said, I really think it's because you're memorizing scripture. And she said, yes. And she said, what's so funny, Susan? She said, I don't have a good memory. And I said, well, are you noticing that your memory's better now that you're memorizing scripture? And she said, yes, I am. So anyway, when I, when I got off Skype with her, I was, went in talking to Doug. And I said, Doug, I was just thinking about all the women I meet with. And I said, you know the women that are growing the most spiritually are the ones that are memorizing great volumes of scripture has nothing to do with me it has to do with them being in the scriptures which is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword right and it's growing them into christ likeness so that is one of the things that i do in helping women to get their minds under control is to think god's words and not some hysterical thoughts and renew their mind well, the second area we're to pass on to women we disciple is teaching them how to love their husbands, to love their husbands. Now, we need to think biblically because in the biblical world, marriages were arranged. And so all of a sudden, this young woman would wake up to this man that she didn't know. You know, how would you like that? And, uh, you know, she had to learn how to love him. But ladies, even in a culture where we marry for love, would you all admit, those of you that are married, that loving your husband is sometimes difficult? I'll be honest, you know. Doug says marriage is a love-hate relationship, so sometimes it's hard. Uh, now, the Greek word for love is phileo. It doesn't mean you fillet him. It's phileo. 
I know sometimes you want to, but it's phileo. And uh, it means you cherish him above everything else. And ladies, we need to teach young women, come alongside them and teach them how to love their husband. It's a privilege, not a burden. How to love them physically, emotionally, spiritually, listen to him. I know many times, uh, you know, I'll be in my office studying right in the middle of a thought or something and Doug comes and he plops himself down in that chair. Like, uh, uh huh, do you want something, you know? And, and uh, so he wants to talk. And so, I, you know, I want that attention from him when, you know, when I want to talk to him. And so we need to train them to listen to their husbands, even if they've had a lousy day, uh, to not hit him with all the things that went wrong when he walks in the door. And uh, we need to teach women uh, to be grateful they even have a husband. I know many women who are widows or divorcees who would love to have a husband. And so I was talking to a lady today who's husband's not doing good and with tears she said I'm just I'm just trying to enjoy every day I have with him because I know know when he'll be gone and so we should be grateful and teach women that to be grateful and to tenderly love their husbands the third quality we pass down to young women is loving her children again think biblically with me woman gets married pretty soon she has baby one and you know it wasn't anything like birth control in the biblical world so Pretty soon she's like Susanna Wesley, 17 children, you know. And, uh, but she's going to have to learn how to love these children. But nothing new under the sun. Ladies, uh, even in a culture where we plan how many kids we're going to have, loving children is sometimes difficult. Would you admit it? I will. I mean, when, when our kids were growing up, Cindy used to say, Mom, you love Charles more than me. And I was like, you're right. I didn't tell her that then. But... Uh, and now I love her dearly, but uh, she was not the compliant child, and Charles was a compliant child. So uh, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard not to show favor to one child who's better behaved, or a child with a handicap, or someone who, a child who is rebellious. And yet, we are commanded to teach young women to love their children. Same Greek word, tender affection. I remember discipling a woman several years ago and she told me, she said, Susan, I don't like hugging my children. And I said, well, you need to get over it. <laughs> and you need to go give them a hug, even if you're not a huggy person, because they need that tender affection. Now, you might say, well, what are some of the best ways to help women love their children? Well, the Bible is so clear on this. Ephesians 6, 4 says, parents bring up your children in the nurture an admonition of the Lord. And so there's two ways that I teach women how to love their children. The nurture, which is discipline, and then admonition, which is words of encouragement. So let's take the nurturing first real quickly here because I do think this is an area, uh, I see it and I have to tell you as Debbie and I have been traveling for these 20 years, uh, this is a common thing that I'm hearing from pastors' wives and uh, women of leadership uh, positions in churches that it's just something I think that I don't know why we have forgotten that parenting is not hard if you'll do it God's way. But uh, discipline is one of the things that seems to have gone out the window. Um, you know, we bring hardship on ourselves when we don't parent the way God tells us to. Proverbs 22, 15 says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Proverbs 23, 13, 14 says, Do not withhold correction from a child. If you beat him with a rod, he will not die. Beat him with a rod, you'll save his soul from hell. And believe me, uh, my father fathered seven of us and we you know we got spanked and uh you know i'm i'm thankful i'm still uh, still alive he says if you beat him with the rod he will not die i didn't die and i'm still here and i'm thankful that uh, my father did believe in discipline proverbs 29 15 the rod and reproof give wisdom but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother right uh, it's not the child uh, that you feel bad for it's the parent and debbie and i've seen if you've ever traveled a lot it's almost it's horrible. I have seen in airports children kick uh, their parents. We, Debbie and I saw one time a young child, probably three or four, a daughter. She kicked her mom, then she hit her grandma on the stomach, and they didn't do anything. And uh, often we see this. Debbie and I see it on the plane, and and you know sometimes I want to go over and I say, "Could I help you?" And then I think no, because they'll probably get their gun and shoot me. So, uh, but you know I just want to say, if you would just do things God's way, this wouldn't be so hard. But uh, Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 13, 24, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. And usually when I'm discipling with a woman and she doesn't discipline her children, I'll ask her, Do you love your children? 
And she'll usually say, yeah, and I say, no, you don't, because you're not, you've just told them five times to do something, and you're not disciplining. And then I bring out what Paul says in Hebrews, whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he scourges every son whom he receives. And if you're not chastened by the Lord, you're illegitimate. You're not a real son. And so, I don't know about you, I've been spanked by the Lord. It's not a lot of fun, but it yields that peaceable fruit of righteousness, right? And so, um, I encourage them that this is the right thing to do. Now, we just don't want to spank our kids all the time, right? Nurture, which is the discipline, but we also want to love our children children, not just by discipline, but by words of encouragement. Um, we need to be encouraging our children in spiritual things, teaching them biblical principles. We do this when we sit down, when we lie down, when we walk by the way. Doug and I, our philosophy in raising our, parent, our kids was not formal like a lot of people today, but just we took the Deuteronomy 6-6 six, six position. When we sit, when we lie down, we walk by the way. Uh, when my husband's brother died of AIDS, he took our eight-year-old son in the room where his brother was dead and he talked to Charles about the wages of sin is death and uh, this is the the the, the uh, what happens when you choose to become a homosexual and you know these things like that and so we just use the teachable moment but we should be teaching our children in in the things of Christ and encouraging them telling them that we love them pray for them I know Charles uh, when he was a teenager he would end up in our bedroom at about 10 30 when I was about ready to turn out the light and go to sleep and here comes Charles plopped right in the middle of the two of us but I thought okay I can miss an hour of sleep because that's when he wanted to talk. And so we need to encourage our children. Uh, don't, don't tear your children down by calling them names. I, I see parents doing that. Um, don't do that. There's so many children in our world that are unloved, and we need to teach these young women to love their children. The fourth area of instruction that we, in the discipling curriculum, is teach young women to be chaste. Paul says teach them to be pure. This would be pure in their heart, pure in their life. Um, we need to teach young women to avoid impure things, to walk within their house with a perfect heart, set no evil thing before their eyes. I know a lot of young women, they get addicted to pornography, uh, which is readily available on the internet. They read unwholesome novels, and uh, the results are disastrous. In fact, they tell us uh, the average woman watches 30 hours of television. I'm like, I, who has 30 hours a week? I've, I don't have 30 hours extra, and certainly I wouldn't use it to watch television, but I meet women all over, and they can tell me what's on television, but they don't know where the simplest things are in the Bible. And uh, so we need to teach them how to pure, be pure. One of the things I usually ask uh, first time I meet with a woman is I ask her about her purity. You know, what kind of things does she watch? What kind of things does she read? Uh, you know, does she have thoughts towards other men? I mean, these are all things that we need to be helping them with. Uh, pure in their speech, pure in their time, pure in their thought life, uh, even choosing right friends. Uh, Paul says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And so I have seen young women who've chosen a girlfriend that is not a good influence, and they spiral down spiritually just because of a wrong friend, an impure friend. And so we need to teach them how to be pure. The fifth thing that we teach them in our curriculum is to be keepers at home. Uh, this is a Greek word which just means housekeeper. It's like the Proverbs 31, 27 woman. She looks well to the ways of her household. She does not eat the bread of idleness. Um, ladies, our first duty to, should be to our home. Uh, to be able to rear children to the glory of God uh, is something that's not going to burn up. And so uh, we need to teach women to be keepers at home. And there's a lot of things under here. I, I can remember I've, I've uh, one gal wanted me to teach her how to organize her kitchen. She didn't know how to do that. I remember Carolyn one time uh, discipling a young girl in our previous church. And, and this woman didn't know how to grocery shop, didn't know how to fix uh, meals. And so Carolyn took her and uh, taught her how to do a menu. She didn't even know how to do that. Um, and so it could be very simple things, how to be hospitable, uh, how to be, fix healthy meals, how to provide a peaceful and happy environment, how to manage their time. I know some young women, they don't know how to manage their time. I had a very good role model in my mom, but not all women are blessed to, to have a mother that uh, managed her time well and uh, could could make her day profitable. So all these things would fall under the category of teaching women to be keepers at home. The sixth quality that we must pass down to young women is to teach them to be good. This means to be benevolent, uh, useful. 
You know, we live in a culture that's isolated, us four, no more. We don't reach out to other people. I remember several years ago, Charles said, Mom, how come people don't invite people for dinner anymore? It's become kind of archaic, you know? And so we're just like, you know, it's just, you know, it's not good because Proverbs says a man who isolates himself brings himself to destruction. And so we need to teach young women to be benevolent, to be good, to reach out her hands to the needy, like the Proverbs 31 woman, to reach her hands out to the poor um, and teach her how to be practical in doing that. Say, hey, you know, there's a need in the church. Have you thought about meeting that? Or uh, is a need in your family or neighborhood? And, you know, we used to just take our kids with us. Um, when we did ministry, we put Charles and Cindy in the car and off we went. And so we need to teach them how to be benevolent, to use their time for the benefit of somebody else. Now, the last thing that we teach them is we teach them to be obedient to their own husbands, to be obedient to their own husbands. Now, I know this is a very controversial subject. I don't know why it is, but it is. But let's talk about submission. When we're teaching a young woman to be submissive, what does that mean, really? Well, the Greek word means to place in an orderly fashion under. Uh, I like this definition. The husband's uh, the president. The wife is the vice president. The husband's a five-star general. The wife is a four-star general. And ladies, we teach them this because the Bible teaches this. Ephesians 5, 23 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Why? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. And so we need to teach her why. We just don't tell her to submit, but we tell her why it is so important. Um, and even Paul says in Colossians, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fitting unto the Lord. And this is what the Lord would have you to do. And even if you're uh, discipling a woman who's married to an unbeliever, she needs to be submissive. Uh, 1 Peter 3, when Peter's talking to the persecuted wives who were being persecuted because of their faith in Christ, their husbands had not accepted Christianity, but they had. He says, you wise in the same manner be subject to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, in other words, they don't obey the gospel, you, without a word, win them over by your behavior, the meek and quiet spirit. And it doesn't mean weakness, and it doesn't mean you never open your mouth. And we don't have time to get into 1 Peter right now, but that's not what that means, even though some people teach that. Now, I will say this. This doesn't mean a lady's a doormat. Women are not doormats. doesn't mean you can never express an opinion. But it does mean that your husband is the head. He makes the final decisions. And it doesn't mean you can't make gracious, godly appeals. And, uh, in fact, usually in our home, when I don't agree with something Doug's going to do or a decision, I'll, one of two things, I'll usually say, could we pray about this for two more weeks? And usually he'll say yes, and so then we'll talk about it again. Or the next thing I'll say is, if he's going to make the decision anyway, I'll say, well, honey, I, I just want you to know I don't agree with you, but, you know, this is your decision. You're the one who's going to stand before the Lord on that day. And uh, so usually when the thing happens, if he's right, he'll say, say those words I love to hear. And that's he was right and I was wrong. And then if I'm right, well, it's another story. So, But uh, a godly marriage, the husband and wife should be able to, you know, discuss things and come to a decision. But you also need to tell the woman that this is going to be a problem her whole married life, and it's part of the curse. Uh, when Eve and Adam sinned, and Eve was given two curses, pain and childbearing, but also he said your desire is going to be, want to be to rule over Adam, but he's going to rule over you. And so women always wanted to control, want to control. That's the way uh, we are, but it doesn't make it right. And it's going to be our desire to want to do that, but we need to teach young women to be submissive. Um, we need to teach her how to let her husband uh, lead. And I'm convinced today, many women today are leading because uh, their husbands just kind of acquiesce to them. And so you need to let him lead um, and don't make important decisions that uh, defy his wishes. I, I remember one time a woman told me, I just told my husband no. And I'm like, well, that one happened in my house, but you know, good for you, I guess. I don't know. Um, there would be one exception to this, and this is, you know, where discipling can get a little sticky at times, but if a husband would ever ask a wife to sin, um, that is where she would need to graciously decline. I have uh, discipled women whose husbands have asked them to do not good things, and uh, that's where she would say, even like I had one lady whose husband wanted her to look at porn with him, and um, so I told her to tell him God 
God's not called you to be impure, but to live a holy life, and I'm not going to do that. And, and if he's a Christian, she needs to begin Matthew 18, but usually it's an unbeliever that does that. So, um, and there's a lot more that could be said about this and the different things. But that's why she needs an older woman, because a lot of times young women don't know the difference between a preference and a sin. And so uh, she might need a help in that. So what is the curriculum we use in disciple? Discipleship, we teach young women to be sober-minded, love their husbands, love their children, be chaste, keepers at home, good and obedient to their own husbands. Now, may I also say this, this does not mean this is the only thing we disciple young women in. Uh, remember what Jesus says, teach them whatever I've commanded you. Um, so there may be times, this isn't all that I do, maybe a woman struggles with worry, anxiety, fear, depression, uh, you know, usually most women that I disciple, I usually get them in the scriptures because that is the thing that's going to change her life, and sometimes uh, we use other books as well. But um, this means that you, as a woman pouring into another woman, uh, need to uh, be a little bit step ahead of her biblically so that you can help her. Now, this might seem like an impossible task, but it is not. Remember what Paul told Timothy? You do it in what? The strength of the Lord, right? And what did Jesus say? Lo, I am with you always. He's with us during the discipling process. Well, in closing, we as women often pass down recipes, clothes, furniture, heirlooms, and all which are perishing, right? Why not pass down something that's not perishing like sound doctrine? Warren Wiersbe once said, the task of the local church is not to preserve the truth as in a museum, but to live it and to teach it to the next generation to come, end of quote. Will you, by God's grace, be a Paul that passes down to some Timothy? Will you pass on sound doctrine to the next generation? I pray you will. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word that you've left for us. I thank you that um, we as women don't have to be roaming around wondering what we're supposed to do with our time and our energies and how we can best glorify you because, Father, you have written it down for us. And I thank you for not only Paul's words to young Timothy, but also for Paul's words to young Titus. And, Lord, the instructions that you have left for us, what a, what a joy-filled rich life it is to be able to um, meet with other women and to help them grow in their walk with Christ. I thank you for those that have poured into my life. I thank you for those that have taken time to instruct me and help me. And Lord, I pray that we in return would give to others and pass down to this next generation sound doctrine. What a need there is for that, Father. So, Lord, guide us as we go into our groups, and may our discussion be encouraging, uplifting, and helpful as we study your word together in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Amen.